Welcome. You are about to view a recorded talk of the Progress and Visions in Consciousness Science online seminar series. This series is organised jointly by the Association for Mathematical Consciousness Science, AMCS, the Mediterranean Society for Consciousness Science, and the Oxford Mathematics of Consciousness Network. While every session consists of a talk and discussions, the latter are not recorded and the following will only contain the talk. We hope you will enjoy it. Further information and details on how to join are available on our website. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and in this very nice series. Um, always um, many, many interesting people and speakers, and I'm, I'm happy to, to learn more in, in discussion with you. And I hope that the talk will be worthwhile. And thanks for coming at this hour. So many of you have maybe already Friday evening and it counts as weekend already. So you're working on weekends. But um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so does that work for you? Does you see that? Okay. Perfectly. So um, <laughs> just to give it one more go, so you can see that Carl is uh, performing active and passive inference at the same time. So <laughs> only he can do it. Um, so yeah, um, I've, as Robert already said, um, I've given this talk before, but I am um, recently stumbled across some more recent work that I'm not familiar with yet because I'm not a philosopher of science, but now um, I have to I had to delve into um, computational modeling, scientific realism debates, and uh, this kind of stuff, um, which I haven't been worked on. I've been working on, so I'm wondering what you think about how I connect some dots here in this um, in this talk. So I going to going to presuppose some familiar, familiar, familiarity with um, predictive processing. I'm not going to rehearse the, the basic idea, but I want to highlight some of the ambitions um, of the framework, and I want to show that they can't make good these um, ambitions. Um, so that's basically the structure. I think the rest will speak for itself. Um, so as you see, um, Base is all the rage, of course. Um, it has been um, proposed by many people as a framework for mental phenomena, for all cognitive phenomena. And, um, you know, it has some revolutionary air with the presentation that they give. You know, it turns a traditional picture of perception on its head. And it is a Co Copernican inversion even of for how to think about perception. So there's always very some some revolutionary air there in, there in how they present um, the framework. And um, I'm going to to identify uh, three ambitions, um, which I call um, completeness ambition. So it's supposed to be about every mental phenomenon, um, Bayesian realism and naturalism. And I'm going to say more about these first and then um, the critical part comes. So the, the claim is that um, none of the ambitions can be well supported since the processing portrays itself as a version of transcendental idealism. And that is, of course, then, if true, uh, uh, in tension with, um, for example, naturalism and the completeness ambition. So the first ambition, completeness. So it started out basically with the work of Carl Friston, as far as I'm informed, as a theory about cortical responses, a, a unified framework for how to think about the brain. So he says that um, several global brain theories can be unified within this free energy framework and the, the processing um, version is, of course, an offshoot of this. Um, in Andy's work, it's portrayed as the first truly unifying account of perception, cognition and action. Then um, Jacob says um, that it's one mechanism which is meant to explain perception and action and everything mental in between. You know, there it's clear. It's a very attractive theory of, of all of cognition. And recently, um, people have also attacked consciousness. So here is Anil, who says that critical processing might supersede, dissolve, or deflate the hard problem of consciousness, um, which will also be in service then of a kind of naturalism that they strive for. So this is sort of the, uh, the aim that many of them, or all of them share, that it's supposed to be an account of all mental phenomena. Second ambition is um, Bayesian realism. So um, they take the Bayesian way of looking at cognition, 
not only to be just one way of looking at cognition, but you know, here's it's one year ago when Anil gave his keynote in Taumina. Um, you know, this really the claim that your brain is a prediction machine. And these claims can be reiterated in other work. So perception attention are but three different ways of doing the same thing. It's one type of mechanism reiterated throughout the brain. Look, it's really implemented in the brain that manages everything. Um, and then there's this converging evidence. They claim that the brain is a Bayesian mechanism emphasis there. Um, also in Andy's work, um, he says that it's a robust Bayesian inferential strategy, which is implemented in the brain. That sounds real enough. Um, and the, the third uh, kind of ambition is um, naturalism, which is not often very specified, but it's in the background and highlighted here in Jacob's book, um, where he says that this view brings us closer to a unified naturalistic account with surprising explanations of many phenomena. Um, and in Andy's and Anil's work, it turns out to be some kind of reductive physicalism um, or illusionism, um, as you may think, because they say that it's supposed to be deflating the heart problem um, and that it puts sort of engineering, neuroscientific and information theoretic flesh on the familiar Dennett style picture, which is, of course, the, um, the illusionist framework. Um, where you know there's nothing like phenomenal consciousness in addition to computational function of information processing that is access consciousness or something like that. And also Anil, a bit more poetic, um, he says that the hard problem intuition that consciousness can never be understood in physical terms will fade away, eventually vanishing in a puff of metaphysical smoke. So that's very, the nice way of putting it. So um, so these are the the, the naturalistic um, ambitions here, um, where naturalism turns out to be a kind of physicalism. So because, you know, if you take David Chalmers' naturalistic dualism as a kind of naturalism, then this is not what is at stake here. It's really a kind of um, a physicalist ambition. Um, so yeah, so these are the um, ambitions. And to, you know, get my entry into Kant, um, I want to look at how they really characterize um, experiential content. So what do we experience really? How is um, the experiential content of consciousness um, characterized? And again, some quotes. Um, so in Jacob's work, um, there's the claim that there's a sense in which this reversal of the standard picture um, of Mar, for example, where you collect information into the brain um, to come up with a with the representation of the world, um, leaves perceptual phenomenology at one remove from the world, um, because perceptual content is really the predictions of the currently best hypothesis. And therefore, then the causes of um, these sensory signals really remain hidden behind the veil of sensory input and can only be inferred. So what we experience is the brain's best guess, right? So therefore, Anil says, we never experience the world as it is. Indeed, as Kant pointed out, he says, with his noumenon, it is difficult to know what it would mean to do so. Um, in different terminology, and maybe one of the earliest writings here in 2007 already, uh, Chris Frith put it in a way that um, perception is a fantasy um, that coincides with reality. So what we actually perceive are our brain's models of the world, not the world itself. And here's a nice um, quote from from Carl Friston. I hope you can hear it. If you believe that everything that we perceive as being real is a hypothesis, you know, uh, the product of a constructive organ, a statistical organ, you know, a little scientist that just is our brain, then all you're saying is that the sensory data are just in the service of confirming that hypothesis or this alternative hypothesis or, the, or another hypothesis. The key observation being it's all hypotheses, it's all fantasy. So, you know, using the fantasy word is nice because it means that the brain is literally a fantastic organ. Right. So, and of course, Andy, um, similar to what uh, Anil has said, we are never simply seeing what's really there. Um, experience is part phantom the product of our deep-seated um, predictions and so on. So it's clear now that um, sort of we have experiential content and 
what the world is is like or what is what is out there is really beyond our reach some so to say because there's this veil of sensory signals that the brain can access so as a summary so just to remind you, the, the processing framework claims to provide a complete account of mental phenomena is portrayed as providing the true computational model of neural processing, because we have these algorithms implemented in the brain. Um, it allegedly supports a physicalist account of the mental that can make do with the heart problem. And it construes conscious experiential content as determined by internal predictions as controlled hallucination, as some of them say. And therefore, it denies us or our brains any direct access to the world as it is. And of course, what we then experience can be put like this, right? Um, Phenomena. Phenomena. <laughs> actually supposed to be my halftime joke but it's only 10 minutes into the talk so it might have been too early but that, that's the place for it so um so yeah you know as Kant has said you know it's all about phenomena and of course the elephant in the room is really the transcendental idealism that is um in the background here when we look at the allusions to Kant um and you know I don't want to put it in this way but you know there's a sense in which they borrow a lot from Kant and you can say that you know there's um lots of commonalities there so for example when you look at the nice introduction to predictive processing by Vanya and Thomas Metzinger um, they, they start on the first page with an allusion to Kant right so the top down and bottom up um, processing um, also Jacob recognizes it in his work there's certainly also a distinct Kantian element to the idea that perception arises as the brain uses its prior conceptions of the world so this emphasis of top-down processing is of course a commonality but there are many more um, commonalities so if you frame Kant's epistemic project in a more cognitive science um, vocabulary you could say that he was after the following question so how can our representations refer to an objective world how can our mental faculties turn subjective sensory data into representations of an objective world and the similarities to PP are this you know Copernican revolution where you take seriously the subjective conditions of our experience that shape what and how we experience the world, which is then exemplified in the balance of top down and bottom up processing in his sense um, or in his context, intuition and understanding. And of course, the claim that we experience the world as it appears to us, but not as it is in itself. And therefore, PP seems to look like a variant of transcendental idealism. But its proponents don't seem to draw the implications of this, given the ambitions that I've just lined uh, up, right? So um, the physicalism seems to be in tension, for example, with um, Kant's transcendental idealism. So we have to look at what's going wrong there, or where is the, how we can break up the tension, or, or who is going to win, or what, what has to go. So it's sometimes difficult to draw this picture of that Kant draws without, you know, already purporting some kind of interpretation of the um, you know thing in itself and appearance distinction so we experience of course we have experiential content of the world but we bring our subjective conditions of experience that shape how the world appears to us and um, you know the the world as it is sort of affects our um, sensory machinery in a way but we don't we can't look beyond how it appears to us but this suggests that there's like two worlds. Um, we can also, in the discussion, if you want, talk about interpretations of transcendental idealism um, as worlds or aspects or properties. Um, I just want to go beyond that here in the in the talk and um, not delve into it. But we can we can talk about it if you want. But this suggests this picture suggests like two worlds. So maybe we should put it this way. So you know there are things in the world and um, they appear to us, but we can't really um, strip away our subjective conditions of experience and look at them as they are in themselves because we can't get off, out of our um, subjective point of view. Um, in, in a way, I think that's analogous to Nagel's argument that, you know, we really can't experience what it is like to be a bat because we don't have the bat machinery and we don't, we can't escape our sort of sensory machinery and um, experience that we can only find out what it is like for us to be a bad. And similarly here, 
um, we sort of we don't have some kind of epistemic reach to the to the things as they are in themselves. But they are not different things. It's just the same things, um, and they appear to us in some sense because we shape them partly. Um, and so, so that's the, the the background here for for Kant. So um, with that, I want to return to the ambitions of predictive processing and look at them bit by bit um, to see what's going wrong. And uh, a good exemplification of this um, justification for physicalism, which is questionable, um, is maybe uh, Thomas Metzinger's discussion in the Ego Tunnel, um, where he writes that, for example, the apricot pink of the setting sun is not a property of the evening sky. It is a property of your internal model of the evening sky, a model created by your brain. The evening sky is colorless, he writes. The world is not inhabited by colored objects at all. It is just as your physics teacher in high school told you, out there in front of your eyes, there is just an ocean of electromagnetic radiation, a wild and raging mixture of different wavelengths. And of course, there seems to be this um, distinction now between what we experience the world to be like and what it is really like. But is that what the world is really like? Um, well, um, we will see. So he reminds us that, of course, he holds a strong supervenience claim because um, the brain and the brain's internal properties are sufficient to determine the properties of your conscious experience. So subjective content is fully determined from the um, from the brain. It's an internal affair. Um, and then he reassures us that, of course, there's an external world that does exist, and our knowledge and action relate us to the world causally, in a way. But in his picture, he always, when he always distinguishes models from, from things in the world, as also here, the model of the sky and what the um, colors um, on wavelength are really like, there is this sort of asymmetry and strange um, strange um, epistemic sort of gap there and how the, how he knows about this right so for example he has a we have models of things in the world right like a chair model for example and we also have a self model right many people in the um, predictive processing literature talk about our self model and and metzinger somehow seems to know that of course there are chairs out there which correspond to our models of chairs, but there's no self um, because being no one, <laughs> there is no self that responds that corresponds to to the self model. So that is such a is is, is just a fantasy of the brain, um, built maybe for constructed for various purposes, um, but there but he somehow knows that there is no self, um, but there is a chair. Um, then how how come he has this kind of knowledge? How how can you make these kind of claims about the world out there? Um, because after all, um, you would say, you know, the way you find out about wavelength and so on um, is just more observation, right? So, so we have our perceptual apparatus and um, we can use cognitive extensions like tools. We can use a microscope, we can use a telescope and so on and look more closely. But how come you would think that this kind of use of cognitive extension tools that are used in physics give us the world as it is just because we look and see and measure different things that we can't see with our eye right so um i would just like to ask that if the world we experience is a fantasy then why should we think the world as described by physics is the world as it is physics is just based on observation too so you just extend your your sensory apparatus by looking closer but do you look behind the veil how can you justify that if all you experience is a fantasy, right? Um, and there's recent work. Um, it's a nice, nice book. I haven't finished reading it, um, but it it promises to be a very, a very nice book. And there's a nice chapter towards the end about predictive processing in the blind spot by Evan Thompson and colleagues. And um, so they write um, about this kind of tension of using predictive processing models to understand something about the computations in the brain and then sort of go beyond this kind of model. So it's not whether the predictive processing theory provides useful models of the brain function, they say, they clearly it does. Even so claiming that the brain is nothing but a predictive processing system is overblown given the current state of the evidence 
and the methodological challenges in testing the models. For all we know, the world outside the model could be entirely mental, as philosophical idealists think, or mathematical, as Platonists maintain. If there's no way to know what's outside the model, there's no way to establish what outside reality is and what concepts apply to it. So you remember that Carl Friston put it in a way that, you know, the sensory signals are supposed to sort of test the hypothesis, but these are just the sensory signals that arrive at us. Um, are these, do they represent accurately what's out there in the world, you know, better than the hypotheses that you have? Um, why? Why would that be? Why would we know, right? Um, in a nice Twitter post, um, Louis Pessoa was very critical about this of taking that too literally. So no one calls the brain the Newtonian brain because we can use differential equations to model it. Yet half of neuroscience seems to think in terms of a Bayesian brain because some version of the formalism can be used to understand something. So um, maybe we can come up with other brains as well, right? A Heideggerian brain or the Kantian brain or whatever. But um, no, the point is clear. Um, so why, how are we justified to, to um, sort of be realists about this kind of mechanism or computational model that then leads us to um, this kind of predicament um, about experiential content being a fantasy. And there's a there's a is even more critic, uh, critical discussion uh, going on. Um, for example, then Zahavi and others um, they point to a sort of inconsistency in the predictive processing framework. If you take that um, very literally, so because there's something special about the brain, obviously. So we observe the brain and we have perceptions of the brain, right? So we, we, we look at it with, with measures. And um, so, so he writes that there's a dilemma here. So either on predictive processing, the brain is also part of experience, then it is a construct and part of the fantasy, which leads to circularity because to explain that kind of representation, you appeal to, to another representation. Or on the predictive processing, um, framework, the brain seems to make up an exception. That seems to be what they have in mind also with Metzinger because that's the basis of everything, right? And we can know about that. But then it remains unclear why only the brain and why is it this sort of the exception and how um, is this move um, justifiable? So the useful neuroscientific models that we can um, formulate about brain function, um, you know, abstract about certain details and so on, they must be separated from the theoretical interpretations and um, sort of also um, keeping in mind from the must be separated from the scientific realism that is sometimes then um, applied to it. And that may be really the problem here. So um, Thompson again, they write that things get worse. So the predictive processing theory is self undermining, they claim when we apply it to perceptual knowledge, particularly our perceptual knowledge of the brain. If perception is nothing more than our brain's best guess about the hidden causes of its sensory inputs, then this must apply equally to our perception of the brain. The physical brain, which was supposed to be objective and outside the model and the source of consciousness, now turns out to be a content inside the predictive model. It follows that we aren't really studying the physical brain when we do neuroscience, at least not directly, we are studying our best guesses about the brain because it's part of the experiential content um, when we perceive or have perceptions of the brain's um, functions in our measurements. It seems to be a strange um, outcome if that would work. Um, and so in other recent work that is also nicely discussed on the Brains blog this week, so I, I would like to alert you to this discussion um, online. Um, Masvita Chirimuta from Edinburgh, she discusses her um, book, which just appeared a few weeks ago. And um, so she has a nice discussion about modeling in general and how kind of um, we can distinguish different standpoints in in the scientific realism debate and um, as i tried to show it seemed that um, the majority of predictive processing proponents are scientific realists in this very strong sense that they think that um, all the entities um, like the generative model and the hypotheses and so on they are really 
implemented in the brain. So this whole me mechanism is to be found in the brain. So they take their model quite literally. Um, and she sort of presents the scientific realism and then presents an alternative to it, alternative way of thinking about it. And that presents some uh, thinkers now in the Bayesian community um, and outside the Bayesian community who look at it a, a bit more critically in the following. So, um, for example, she, she introduces scientific realism in the strong sense um, as asserting that the world has a determinate mind independent structure and that scientific theories are to be interpreted literally as truth app representations of their target domain. And that well-established and predictively successful scientific theories are approximately true representations of their targets such that observable and unobservable entities posited by those theories actually exist. So that seems to be familiar, very um, strong and clear kind of um, scientific realism. Your, your theories and models are really literally true. Um, and she, she points out that this um, has been the dominant stance in um, also philosophy of mind in a naturalistic framework. Um, where it is presupposed as a background assumption mostly, and um, try to work out that this is also seems to be the case in the predictive processing um, community. So the root conception of scientific knowledge at work in realism is that of a mirror being held up to nature. The world is out there, and it is the task of science to receive an image of it. And of course, it sort of seems to presuppose a picture of nature where nature is quite simple, um, because of the simplicity of our models. So if our models are um, simplifications or, or simple, at least in the sense, then, then this whole complexity of the world is also to be rejected in a favor of some kind of simplicity. And there's some caution here in the Bayesian um, community um, when, for example, Colombo and Series um, write that, you know, these Bayesian models do not provide any mechanistic explanations. They are, um, useful devices for predicting and systematizing observational statements. And um, they recommend this kind of um, instrumentalist attitude towards Bayesian models in neuroscience. So that's really the other end of the on the spectrum, right? Um, so just be instrumentalist. We have some certain epistemic interests and they may differ in the scientific community and models may differ. And in that sense, sort of, we can't take them too literally. And there, uh, there's a nice, um, very, not for me illuminating because I'm really not in that um, um, literature, but um, so in a paper by Hartmann, Colombo and Elkin, they introduce lots of different um, alternative ways of modeling a cognition. Um, and I've never heard of them. dempster schafer theory, imprecise probability, possibility theory, ranking frameworks, and so on. So, Johannes, you can nod if you have heard about them. <laughs> but um, they make a case for them being um, sometimes equally um, good, or in some cases, for some purposes, even uh, superior to Bayesian modeling, and, and so on. And they argue that, you know, Bayesianism as such, as a way of, of looking at things, does not have any special epistemic virtues. It isn't simpler. It isn't more unifying. It isn't more rational than the other alternatives. And it isn't better, better supported by empirical evidence. So they really point to a kind of pluralism of, of modelings and um, ways of modelling. And why would you then sort of put all your money on um, predictive processing as one version of the Bayesian framework in general um, that it can be used to model cognition, for example? Um, so that's one sort of um, nail in the coffin of, of, of a realist attitude towards this um, kind of Bayesian um, processing. Um, and there's more there's more quotes here from this nice paper. Um, so they recommend again an anti-realist attitude, um, and you know they call it here in this paper anti-realism that they have in mind, um, according to which successful scientific models and theories should be understood as conceptual tools or instruments for achieving practical goals and engaging with the world. They should not be understood as descriptions of how things stand in the world. So, and that's the stark contrast to how um, the others put it. And they refer to people like Clark and Howie and also Riscola, um, who are committed to methodological naturalism and 
Therefore, they should not believe predictive, predictively successful Bayesian models have actual counterparts in mental architectures or brains. Instead, their arguments about the architecture of mind, about mental representation and the nature of mental phenomena should reflect an agnosticism or skepticism in the existence of theoretical entities and processes posited by Bayesian models, for example, um, a generative model in the brain and so on. So that's really like a um, really um, op opposed um, um, perspective. Um, I'm going to skip that slide. Just too much text. Um, so in her in her recent book, um, Masvita Shimuta, she um, motivates an alternative uh, position and um, reflects a little bit further on on models. Um, so if you look back to the times of uh, Putnam and, and Marr and so on. So computational models really came, became fashionable as a response to a kind of identity theory of the brain where mental or cognitive phenomena or states were just identified with brain states. And then, you know, you would have to have a brain like ours to be in pain and so on. That was very strict uh, neurochauvinistic position. And so functionalism sort of provided a kind of way of looking at um, cognition in a bit a more abstract way it allowed for multiple realizability and artificial intelligence, and of course, the possible medium independence of cognition and so on. So this is one, one motivation for going computational. And, um, and an, another one, another important one is of course, our epistemic limitations, um, as she um, emphasizes in understanding complex systems in general, but also the brain. So we need simplifications um, and abstractions to to make to illuminate something for us because it's just too complex to understand um, as it is. And any kind of mathematization um, in such a model involve abstraction and um, idealization. You omit a lot of detail. So that's an old point that has been mentioned by in Searle's work, of course, um, against functionalism. But of course, um, the difference here is that Masvita um, really knows the neuroscience, <laughs> while Searle didn't. So uh, she knows about the complexity and and, and um, has a much better um, grasp of, of what's going on there. Um, so there's lots of detail there, uh, which you intuitively um, can can know. Um, that is omitted in the in the models, um, and of course, often you um, you focus only on commonalities. For example, in the computer model of the mind, you would focus on certain commonalities of the brain and the computer, which are very different systems, of course. <clears throat> and you know that the representation of the target system in the model is wrong in some ways, right? So it, it's not um, to be taken literally in a sense, but nevertheless, um, these models can be useful heuristics in um, understanding certain processes. And um, computational models of the brain, they use simplifying analogies. Um, and then that depends then on the scientists selective perception of similarities, um, just to gain some tractable understanding of, of the complexity um, that you cannot grasp in, in one go. Um, but there shouldn't be an expectation that there's only one way of carving up a computations um, or the computational processing in the brain. So different research interests, different disciplines will model cognition in different ways. And these models need not be inconsistent with each other or incompatible with each other, but they will be very different. Um, so there's, ex there's likely to be many possible ways of sort of idealizing or um, abstracting uh, the processing that goes on and, and simplif simplifying it, even maybe in other ways than computational models. So, so that's a, a point that she really um, stresses, um, where sort of you can already see that, the, um, that there's a pragmatic element here because the, in a Kantian way, again, because the, the scientists' interests and questions and that we ask, uh, they, they come into play here and they shape the kind of modeling that you will, that you will perform. <clears throat> and this sort of critical stance is um, really nicely put here in um, Grace Lindsay's book, where she writes, all models are wrong, starts the popular phrase by statistician George Box. Indeed, all models are wrong because all models ignore some details that was mentioned 
All models are also wrong because they represent only a biased view of the processes they claim to capture. And all models are wrong because they favor simplicity over absolute accuracy. All models are wrong the same way all poems are wrong. They capture an essence, if not a perfect literal truth. All models are wrong, but some are useful, says Box. I'm sorry for the email. Um, so that's, um, that's in a nutshell the message here. And if you uh, one example here from the from even the Bayesian modeling in the predictive processing community, um, if you use as a back, as a foliage um, mass a threefold um, distinction between levels of description and explanation, you can sort of formulate a computational task um, in terms of, for example, the task of minimizing prediction error. So if that's what the brain is doing in various ways, then there's this uh, unification in the sense that, you know, imagination, attention, perception, they all are in the service of minimizing prediction error. And then this kind of predictive processing will then be flexible on the algorithmic level, how it is carried out in the brain, right? The, um, there's a, how it all started with Rawan Balat's um, algorithm where you where the prediction error is computed in terms of subtraction, for example. Um, Michael Spratling devised um, a different um, uh, algorithm that calculates the prediction error by division. And so it has also explanatory purposes. It's sort of also an implementation of the computational task of minimizing prediction error. And on the implementation level, these different algorithms, they will map onto different cortical structures. So we've discussed this in a paper um, that you mentioned in the introduction with Chris Dolega against um, Howie and Seth's discussion of the predictive processing framework guiding the search for neural correlates of consciousness. So this is one problem for this search, for example, because they, they claim that, you know, with the processing can help us find systematic neural correlates of consciousness. But if the different algorithms that you use will map onto the, the cortex differently, then what is then the, the, the true kind of neural correlate of consciousness in the end? If there's some so much flexibility given the multiple realizability down from the top level to the bottom levels. So there's different ways in which information flows can be consistent with the same neuroanatomical evidence here. Um, and in that sense, then it's not clear. So are all these kinds of um, algorithms implemented in the brain when they say, um, there's a prediction error minimization mechanism in the brain. Are there all algorithms that you can possibly devise and formulate, um, implemented, or only one of them? Um, that's one problem. Another problem comes from Rosa Kao, who um, really says that um, in her telling paper, uh, New Labels for Old Ideas, where she says that um, it doesn't in, in in information theoretic respects. It doesn't really make a difference if you call the neural activity that goes bottom up, um, bottom up input or sensory input that is um, um, as collecting some kind of information to build up a, a three dimensional image of the of the world, or if you call it an error signal, because in information theoretic terms, um, it sort of has the same kind of effects. From the point of view of the system, she says, um, I can I can I just quote here, um, the priors um, by definition must be given, the system has to have them in order for the central notion of uncertainty reduction in information theory to make sense. So information uh, theory requires some kind of comparison of, of, um, of, in, in, of information. And then what one person calls the kind of error signal carries the exact same information as what some other person might call the bottom-up input. So um, all the rage about revolutionary um, turning the, the picture upside down, she sort of um, formulates some caution here that, you know, um, in information theoretic terms, there's no difference. Um, well, that also cautions us to, to take it too literally what they um, sort of posit as kind of mechanisms in the brain. So what's the alternative? So we have seen already the scientific realism and the sort of 
on the other end, the instrumentalism recommended by Colombo and colleagues. Um, so Masvita formulates um, a, what she calls an a haptic realism, and this is for, similar. I think maybe the details will matter. Um, is similar to perspectivism as it has been introduced and defended by Michela Massimi um, in a recent award-winning book. Um, if you know if you um, followed that. Um, that won the, the Lakatosh Award um, last two weeks. Um, so I think these are um, similar perspectives, um, although maybe the perspectivism from Massimi is more closer to the scientific realism than um, Masvita's haptic realism, because that really seems to be grounded in, in the Kantian um, philosophical mindset, um, because she already... Um, looks at it as a kind of transcendental idealism. So why she call, why does she call it haptic? Because um, it's um, a metaphor that sort of makes vivid the uh, sort of scientists manipulation of, of, the, of the target system that you investigate, right? So by applying all kinds of tools, you sort of, sort of change the system, you interfere with it and you do things with it. And, and that's sort of, um, it's not a, it's not an idealist picture in the sense that you know there's no brain. Of course, there is the the world, and then there's the target system that you investigate. But um, your model of of this kind of system will be informed strongly by what you do with it and what you bring to the table. Just like Kant says, for knowledge, right? You you bring certain uh, concepts into um, into bearing, and there's the same holds here for. Um, computational modeling. So um, she says, while scientific realism asserts that the best confirmed theories offer approximately true representation of how things stand in nature, haptic realism insists that the acquisition of scientific knowledge is an active process in which the scientist's schematization and the work that goes into shaping the material target of research leave an indelible imprint on scientific knowledge. This means that scientific representations, theories, and models of systems in nature should not be interpreted as approximately true accounts of those things as they are in themselves, independent of interaction with the scientist. I suggest now that this version is, uh, of realism can also be taken as a kind of transcendental idealism. And maybe one should also say, with respect to Kant, um, his position is always transcendental idealism and empirical realism, right? It's not only like a, because that's always important against some kind of Berkeleyan um, interpretation of his idealism. It grants that things exist beyond the human mind, but it also holds that we cannot know them as they are in themselves, as they are um, not in respect to relations with the human cognizers. Okay. And, and the picture that, that sort of results from all this um, seems to be, so there's multiple ways of, of devising and formulating computational models of the brain. Um, and the predictive processing Bayesian model is only one of them. Um, and all of them may be informed by different interests from the researchers, and they may discover different kinds of computations and posit different kinds of um, algorithms or mechanisms. But none of them can claim that they have found the one and true kind of computation. So you can um, look at the brain here, even within this predictive processing model, you, you have to choose the computational tasks. Maybe there is not only one of them, right? You, the, the way you, you look at the task will be very different from the kind of angle or discipline that you come. And um, given the computational task, there will always be flexibility in the algorithms that are carrying out the task, as I've shown with um, respect to Michael Spratling's work. There will be also flexibility in the implementations of different algorithms as they map on the brain differently, um, which gives us um, surprising results in terms of, of neural correlates and so on. So why would you claim that one of these models can claim to uncover or disclose the real persisting patterns existing independently of the scientific process? So why would you have to claim that, you know, the, the processing model gets it right and then this kind of mechanism is implemented in the brain because it carries out this kind of task? Um, and you can also ask yourself um, more broadly whether computational models of cognition 
can capture all of cognition because there may be aspects of the mind um like maybe affective processes or consciousness also which have been identified or you know said to be non-computational non-cognitive in in the sense um maybe if, if chalmers is right for example then of course consciousness cannot be treated in the same way as cognitive processes because it goes beyond um that and then it will escape some kind of computational model that's why they um like Anil and, and Andy are also so keen to to just, you know, defend a, an illusionist stance with respect to consciousness, because you can't have phenomenal consciousness in addition to some kind of computational performance. And then you have to come up with a story, which kind of cognitive processing in the brain is the conscious one. And if you have looked at the attempts to do so, um, there have been quite strange um, proposals right you know the, so Andy in one of his papers has identified some kind of mid-level hypotheses which we take to be very um, um, confident which we are very confident about um, why is confidence what, what does it have to do with phenomenality right? so why would it feel like this um, um, there's also a discussion of this in our um, paper but um you see that then you have some kind of problem of of putting consciousness in there some in some sense um because maybe not everything can be captured by a by a computational model so that's just one one sort of um hint anyway so i'm approaching my conclusions so uh, looking back at the ambitions um i tried to argue that you know the bayesian realism that they um, defend or seem to presuppose in the background given what they write that's my interpretation of it, um, is not well supported by the scientific practice of modeling, as I tried to show, because um, perspectivism and haptic realism capture better the nature and scope of models. There's rarely um, an expectation in any domain where one model gets it completely right. right? Um, completeness, I haven't said much about this, but this follows from the kind of way that they treat content, the contents of um, conscious experience. Um, it seems that consciousness cannot be explained in the same terms, um, since it is presupposed as the entry point to how we know about anything. So that if you look at the blind spot book, that will be um, sort of the, the main point. Um, and of course, also in the Kantian framework that sort of seems to result from, from the discussion of content, um, you can't sort of go behind conscious experience and, um, and, and try to, to capture it in, in this way because that's what's going to be presupposed in, in, in any sense. And the naturalism, um, I try to, to shed some doubt here, um, because uh, not in the sense that naturalism is or physicalism is false, it's just that it's a completely independent issue. So if you are a pluralist about modeling, then nothing follows about this mechanism being implemented in the brain. And then whether PP or another framework, none of them can give you any hints towards naturalism in either rejecting or supporting naturalism. It's just a different sport. Um, so you can be a naturalist of one stripe or another stripe and then can still do your modeling, but um, there will not be any support for physicalism in the sense that you um, can claim, oh, well, I found the computational model in the brain and therefore um, we can identify this mechanism and so on. Well, I think that's about it. Um, so thanks for your attention and uh, yeah, looking forward to our discussion.